No, yeah, I'm going to, uh, it's recorded now. I just pushed the button. So I'm going to call the, um, council, the, excuse me, the council's finance committee meeting of May 9, 2023 to order at 5.30 PM. And, uh, I want to just, uh, remind anyone who's, uh, watching from the audience at this meeting is being held by Zoom. Members of the public have access to the meeting via Zoom. And uh, please, but please be advised that this meeting is being recorded. And I'm just going to make sure that everybody who I know is present can hear and be heard. We have several members of the council who are present, but we do not have a quorum of the council. Um, and this, so let me just do that quickly. Um, and I'll start with um, Lynn Griesmer. Present. Uh, Anna Devlin Gaffney. Uh, present, Anna. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, Bob Wigner. Present. Ed Halloway. Present. Uh, we know that Kathy's absent, and I have not seen Bernie or Felicia. And uh, Members of the council, uh, is my, I, Dorothy, you're Dorothy. Pam, I'm here. Pam Rooney is here. Yeah, I am here. Pam, you heard us. Okay, to acknowledge it. So let me just uh, say very quickly uh, to acknowledge that I really appreciate the school committee. Um, being here for um, the meeting that was scheduled before, uh, I realized that today is a Amherst School Committee Day, and the meeting is um, that meeting has been posted for that reason. We are not going to do public comment um, at the beginning of the meeting, which is what has become our normal practice. But we're going to wait until after um, we um, have a chance to talk about school budget and um, we are going to go straight to that topic and um, I know that there have been a series of questions that have been uh, put together and uh, that um, they've been transmitted to um, uh, superintendent and uh, Doug Slaughter the school finance director and I don't know if Allison has seen the questions that were submitted in advance or not, um, but we try and get the questions uh, if we can, as many as possible. Um, so, Anna, you have your hand up. I, was... I do. I have a quick um, just disclosure. I am filing a disclosure form with the town clerk's office. My mom is an employee of the Amherst school system. Um, however, as this budget, the town council does not determine budget items within the school budget. Uh, we merely vote on the total budget generally. So I'm, there is not a conflict of interest here. No action that I take will impact my mom's salary. So I am uh, remaining in the room for the conversation and will be participating, but wanted to make sure that was on the record. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. And I see that Jennifer Taub is not here. So uh, Jennifer, I assume you can hear us and Okay. Yes, I can. Thank you. Okay. So uh, with that said, uh, we have all received a copy of the uh, budget was in the packet for today's meeting and the link was sent some time ago to uh, members of the committee. I don't. And so I hope that the other counselors have had a chance to see the budget. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know if there's anything that you want to say in advance, Sean, or should I just turn it over? Yeah, um, I'll just quickly, um, Doug, I, I guess the best format would be to give a quick overview. And then um, there were a number of questions submitted for the school. So I think going through those questions, Doug, um, and then we can open it up to the committee just to make sure that nobody asked the same question that was already sent in. Yeah, I think the only thing I will add is in the conversations that I had by email with uh, uh, Mike, the um, wanted to give him the opportunity to give any overview also, and we wanted to focus on questions um, in which he might have questions that he's seen that he feels are particularly appropriate to him. Um, 
he indicated that Doug could stay a little bit longer, but he has a hard stop um, at five after six so that he can uh, switch gears and get um, himself ready for the uh, uh, school committee meeting. And I gather that Allison is also uh, wanting to do that too. So um, what I would suggest is um, ask uh, our superintendent to give whatever overview of the budget that he would like to um, give and uh, respond to any of the advanced questions that uh, he thinks are particularly appropriate. And I'll come back to that again and then see if uh, ask the same question of Allison um, as chair of the committee. So um, actually, I think Allison's going to start if that's okay, Andy. Absolutely. Yeah, I just wanted to um, uh, introduce because I, I know and I appreciate um, the, that um, the school committee approved um, and passed a budget that is different than the guidance and different than the budget that um, Paul, the town manager, has submitted to to the finance committee in the in the town council. So I just wanted to um, give that sort of super high level sort of rationale and sort of update folks on on the conversation that that happened within the Amherst School Committee that drove us to that point. So um, we initially developed the budget with the two and a half percent guidance that we had originally received, despite the, the conversations and very difficult conversations about the extent to of cuts to level services. Um, so cuts to existing currents and prog um, programs and services within our district. So yes, the budget is increasing, but our but because our costs are increasing at a greater extent than what the guidance of two and a half percent was originally, we had to make program cuts to our existing programs and services. So when um, we got the, the the great news that um, the guidance was being increased up to three percent due to the changes, um, uh, the changes in estimates and, and state funding, the school committee felt very strongly that given the extreme situation and, and because it's impacting the student experience, um, the, the cuts to programs and services that we wanted to try to preserve, use some of that additional funding or to preserve those positions and services um, to lessen the impact on the student experience as much as possible. Um, because of the strong outcry from the community um, and continued strong um, uh, pressure um, and, and comments that we're receiving from the community to not make cuts and to use as much of our budget to, um, I mean, we have multiple open contracts right now, so we don't have that settled in terms of what our um, payroll is going to be landing at. Some of that is in contingency, um, but really wanted to honor some of the concerns that we were hearing from, from the community in terms of the impact that the cuts to programs and services would be having on the student educational experience. So that is the rationale behind the, I believe it's about 80,000, Doug can give you the exact amount of the difference between sort of the recommended budget from the town manager and the approved budget from the school committee. But that is primarily to help us preserve some of those positions and, and some of the programs and services um, uh, in, in this existing, in the current budget year. So I'll let Mike sort of explain more of that. Sure. Andy, is it okay to jump right in? Yes. Okay. So um, this fiscal year, we have, uh, we're accessing uh, potentially the last of our ESSER funds. ESSER funds were funds given in to districts and the three waves, uh, you know, during um, the, from the beginning to where we currently are in the pandemic, we were really thoughtful, in my opinion, in our approach. I want to thank Doug and principals, you know, so we had to do some things like change the infrastructure of walls at Fort River and Wildwood so that the schools were, had better ventilation when students returned from the lockdown time. Uh, we spent money on air purifiers for the same reason. We spent money on PPE, uh, additional nursing staff so that students could return uh, as safe as possible. Uh, but we also added some other items as well. And so uh, while we did add a lot, we also knew that, you know, potentially there was going to be challenges fiscally in the future. And so in the approved budget, um, there's um, a little over $500,000 
that we'd save from ESSER to supplement um, the existing budget uh, to maintain uh, most of our level of staffing and services for the next fiscal year. Uh, we did. We are reducing some of those positions that were added. Uh, particularly, we have a special education teacher we added in the intensive need program, and due to enrollments, that position is not needed anymore. So that you'll see a reduction. But that is the only special education reduction needed. We know that our students with special needs have had uh, faced, uh, in general, more significant challenges than their typical peers during the period of closure and the period of COVID. And uh, we will have to look at enrollments in the future, but at the current time, a priority of ours was maintaining that level of services and support for students with special needs. Um, we also uh, were able to maintain all of our mental health staffing and supports. It's come as no surprise to anyone who follows schools or reads newspapers that the pandemic was particularly hard on children, not just academically, but social emotionally. And so we, we maintained our suite of supports for students, you know, with the guidance counselor, adjustment counselor, and psychologist. We've also done a significant amount of reshuffling. This isn't reflected in the budget documents, but it's been in other public documents because we have seen shifts of enrollment. For instance, Fort River's gotten a bit larger uh, and the other two schools, school, schools over the last five years have reduced. So we right size some of our staffing disparities between the schools, which will enhance and make more efficient uh, our service delivery at each of the schools. And so that was a couple years overdue, but now that we're back, you know, a couple years in person, it seemed like the right approach to take. Uh, we did have some reductions of the appropriated budget in terms of paraeducators and classroom teachers. And again, um, those are somewhat based in enrollments, but uh, we maintain five uh, full-time specialist teachers art, music, physical education, library, and technology in each of our three elementary schools. And I think that's a sort of a summary of where we are. Um, Doug, I don't know if you wanna add things now or go into the questions. I just, I'm sensitive to the fact that Allison and I have about 15 minutes. So if there's questions that are directly uh, for us to answer instead of Doug, you know, uh, we have this window of time, but um, there is a hard stop because we do have to get over to the high school. Yeah, um, I think that the uh, one that really is uh, direct to what we've talked about so far is question number one on the sheet. And um, for the um, other members of the council and anybody else who's not seen it, um, mm -hmm. it reads as follows. The school committee voted three to two on March 14 to approve the Amherst Elementary Schools FY24 budget, adding $84,000 in changing the reduction in staff from four classroom teachers to two, reduction of paraeducators from 10 to seven, and strongly urged the superintendent and finance director to keep the three full-time paraeducator positions. And I note that that uh, was pretty much uh, popping from the minutes of the uh, March 14 meeting. And so the questions were, how is the $84,000 determined? What is the cost to maintain two classroom teachers and three paraeducators? What would, uh, what would happen to these positions in FY25? So we're really trying to determine where the $84,000 came from and how it relates to the staffing part of the motion that was made and passed on a three to two vote at the school committee meeting. I see Allison's hand is up, so I, Allison? Yeah, I, I, yeah. Um, I just wanna clarify, the vote was three to two um, that I am I can speak for myself and I think also my colleague um, who also was in uh, one of the two of us that, that vo voted no, it wasn't about the budget number per se, it was specifically about adding the caveat and the constraint um, it, it was how we were going to use that additional money. The school committee, um, I, if you watch the conversation, was unanimous in in sort of the desire for that additional eighty four thousand um, dollars to re to as I as I led off with to reduce the impacts um, of the reduction in, in programs and services. Then the calculation um, that number came from a calculation of the dollar value of the 3% increase in the town operating budget. Um, so it was a straight arithmetic and hopefully our math was, was reasonably accurate. 
Um, but it was taking sort of that that difference of that half percent on the town proposed operating budget, what that total dollar was, and suggesting that if that were to go all to the schools, whether it's the between the elementary district and the regional district, how how would we what would that dollar value be? So that's how that eighty that's where that eighty four thousand dollars came. Um, and then looking at sort of the impacts of where um, where a lot of the reductions were being made. Yes, there's some enrollment driven reductions um, that were included in the initial proposal. Um, and what we what the school committee wanted to do was to reduce some of the non enrollment um, driven uh, reductions in staff. And the and the vote in particular was whether we were going to give guidance on which particular positions, not the number of positions, but which particular positions. Okay. Is there any follow up questions on what Allison just said from many counselors or committee members present? Um, seeing none, uh, I guess the other question that I wanted to make sure that was uh, responded, did you get a chance to respond to Mike before you had to leave, was the uh, additional question that I sent you this afternoon. Um, and just again, so everybody's aware of what it was, reads as, uh, according to the FY24 staffing numbers, the total number of staff, both the elementary and regional schools is 344, and that's elementary 308 and regional, um, oh, 644 and regional 336. In 2009-10, the total uh, staffing number was 627, elementary 299, regional 238. From 2005 to today, we have a 30% decline in elementary school enrollment and a 39% decline in middle school enrollment, the 34% decline in high school enrollment. Um, and yet our staffing numbers are higher today than they um, when we had a lot more students and uh, asking for an explanation. I think actually Doug can answer that one. I see his hands up. Before um, Doug does, um, we have a quorum now for the council and you might want to. In a, Yes. In addition to that, Alicia has joined. So we need to make sure. So uh, given that we have a quorum of the council present, I'm going to call the council to order, and I, since all the other counselors have been checked on, I will just ask Alicia on behalf of both the finance committee and the council, are you present and can you hear us and we can hear you? Yes, thank you, Lynn. Thank you so much, Alicia. Okay. So, so just, to, just to answer the question a little bit, I took a few minutes uh, to, to look over some, some historical data. Uh, one of the one of the pieces that adds to staff uh, is that we brought our food service program back in house, and so the staffing for that has added a number of people to uh, to shy of twenty total, I think, um, uh, to our staffing. So that's one reason for an increase in number of staff, and that that increases. But you know, you would expect with an, a decrease in enrollment, uh, we'd have a, an overall uh, loss in staff. And I think that as you look through that that uh, sort of history, you see the changes in programming that we've done and some losses in staffing that we've had. Uh, but what you also see is an increased need in, in some other areas like special education and in particular um, uh, paraprofessionals that that support our students in one to one circumstances or special programs. And so that's that's really the really short answer uh, on on where those those additional sort of staff FTEs come from. Um, you know, it's one thing to sort of identify it. It's another thing to do something about it. Certainly the superintendent of I have had some initial conversations about about you know what do we do? We know kind of what what that what the driver is, um, sort of how we approach uh, solutions to that are are uh, uh, an area that we need to spend some time on and think about deeply in the next year or two because it is a difficult thing. Mike, yeah, I think the only two things I'd add is one is this budget. You know, while the rest are funded, reduces uh, the FTEs by seventeen point four two. So pretty significant reduction from FY23 to FY24. 
I think the second thing to note is, you know, I think Paul sent a memo. Um, thank you, Paul, for that. Just that we recognize that, you know, we want to maintain high quality schools and that we've got fiscal pressures. And so appreciate uh, both Sean and Doug and the town uh, trying to partner and, and thinking about how do we pave a uh, path through to a future where we can maintain the level of support and staffing that the families uh, uh, and students really uh, rightfully um, desire. Uh, people move here for the schools and we can't do that without sufficient staff. And, um, and so that, that, that's the other next step on this front as well. Matt? Hey Andy, I hate to do this. I'm gonna to have to hop off at six. So I just wanna let you know now so I don't interrupt things. And I did have a question for um, Doug just on that last point. Um, would you be able to provide us with um, teacher FTEs for the past, five, let's say five years or something? I mean, you know, like I think that, that's interesting, the food service workers um, point. I just, I don't think I was aware of that, but it, it would be helpful to know, you know, sort of in terms of core instructional staff, if, if, that, if that holds true. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Yeah. Thank you. So um, is there anybody else who has anything that they want to follow up on right now? Because I don't know if, uh, turning back to um, Mike and Allison, if you've seen the questions, if there are any that you feel you'd like to be able to speak to um, or you have to leave since uh, then Doug will be here follow up but some and some of those are just pure budget questions that he can I, mean, I know he can respond to yeah I don't I mean Doug actually doesn't have school committee meeting tonight there's no fiscal things on it for a change um so um but I also have great confidence and Doug did share his responses with me so um I feel like he's got both a good handle of the budget but also a good handle of the you know academic operations of the school so I feel very confident um but you know appreciate folk sensitivity the fact that Allison and I got to hop over to an in-person meeting in a little bit um Allison I don't know if there's anything else you'd like to share but I felt very I feel very comfortable with even the rest of the questions with Doug um having not seen the questions um but I I trust also that Doug is is going to be able to answer the questions I probably wouldn't be able to answer them as as well as he could anyway um so I I was um you know I think the most important thing is to is to share sort of it, to just state that that was the the school committee intent and and um and desirous of of not wanting to impact student experience as um as much as we're seeing um and that we were unanimous in that despite the the the, the appearance of that of that particular vote. See if, uh, Pam, you have a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question, and it was on the consolidated spending plan sheet. And I was looking at school administration and central administration. So those are about together a little over $2 million. And um, so they're roughly 30% of the regular instruction cost. Um, I wondered if, if the special ed, and on another sheet, there was special ed um, administration. And I wondered if special ed administration is actually all included in the in the school administration number, or is it or is it sort of part of the the big cost of special education, including all of its administrators? I can take that if you'd like. Um, the short answer is is that the special ed administration is largely contained within the central administration. Um, at the school level, uh, they're typically not in administrative roles. There are a few uh, at the elementary, um, a small, uh, not even a full FTE that would be in school administration a little bit, but but most of that uh, special education administration cost is, is in our central administration. Actually, right, no, that's, I'll stay with that. <laughs> See, it's right, whatever. So turning again to the full group of uh, counselors and committee members present, um, uh, Mike and Allison have about five minutes left. And if there are any questions that anyone has that um, you feel are particularly you'd like to hear from superintendent uh, and the school committee uh, chair, please say so now. And Anna. 
So I apologize. I was desperately trying to Google so that I could find my own answer to this question because I like to be resourceful, but I, I couldn't do it fast enough. So I'm asking you now. Um, when we think about our advocacy for chapter 70 aid and our per pupil, um, our per pupil aid that we receive, is there any difference in per pupil aid for students who are involved, who are enrolled in special ed, uh, in, in terms of like the intenser, more intense special ed programs versus those who are in regular instruction only? Is there any differentiation in state aid there? And is that something that you all or we should be advocating for given the increases in, in um, special ed funding over the, I'm looking at the comparison 2020 to 24. Um, and the and three, I think it's a three percent drop in regular instruction spending. I'm curious if that's an area of advocacy that should is or should be pursued, or if that exists. I don't know who that's directed to, and I'm sorry. Sure. So I I, I can uh, make uh, what will probably be my final comment, and then pass it to Doug. So I was in a meeting yesterday with a bunch of other area superintendents, uh, Hampshire and Franklin County, with the new Secretary of Education, um, Dr. Tutwiler, and. Um, you know, I was asked, I was one of the people asked to speak, our state representative and state uh, senator were actually there as well, which was fabulous. And, you know, I, my topic was fiscal cliffs. So tremendously fun, uh, you know, engaging and inspiring topic, I think. But, you know, my colleagues spoke about some of the other fiscal challenges, including the one you mentioned. And so uh, Doug can get into the specifics, but in general, there's, there's kind of two frames on it. One is what do we do for students who receive their education outside the district because their their special needs are, are, are such that we their needs can't be met in, in our district. And there's a lot of different pieces, you know, our out of district costs, uh, everyone's in the state went up 14% this year. That was state mandated increase. That's, you know, way above, you know, what anyone was budgeting for what we've seen in the past. And the attempt to ameliorate that that's been going on right now in the state house has, has benefited some districts and not others. It's not like on a per student basis, which might actually be like, oh, if you have these number of students, you get this increment. It, it's actually designed to be much more ornate than that. And the ornateness means that whole harmless districts like ourselves have a limited benefit from that. So, so that's like one really big significant variable in it. Um, but as I depart, I know Doug will talk about some of the other pieces as well. But thank, thank you all for having us and uh, good luck with the rest of your meeting. Thanks for representing us yesterday. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. So just to add a, a little bit more to that, um, I think that you know if, if you look at the chapter 70 formula itself, yes, it does have it does have components of it that, that take into consideration a number of categories uh, of student, uh, ELL students, special education, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, for us, because of where we sit relative to our uh, current level of funding, our number of students, et cetera, we generally fall into sort of the, the they call the hold harmless, and so we just get a per student, a, a, you know, sort of addition to our our base. Um, but nonetheless, in in calculating that sort of base amount, is that uh, those different kinds of students, and so there are factors there that are part and parcel of the of the formula. Um, you know, could it help us more? Yeah, it could help us more, but it would also help everybody else more. So um, it is there, and I, it, it it's a you know as as uh, Sean Mangano can tell you too, uh, is a pretty complex formula. Is, you know, a lot of, of uh, I think a lot of political energy went into sort of finding that balance. Um, you know, are there other ways, uh, as the superintendent suggested, relative to the out of district placements and, and the increase there to help mitigate some of those increases? Uh, there are some other avenues of advocacy that could have a, a much more direct and immediate impact for us. Thank you. And yeah, I, the chapter 70 formula is, is a fun maze to try to learn. So I appreciate you kind of explaining it to me. Uh, in simple terms. Yes, Sean. Um, this is a question for Doug. I wish I asked it when um, Mike and Allison were here, but Doug, have you heard anything from um, the Department of Ed that breaks down the governor's proposal for the fair share amendment um, and in terms of what it might mean for school districts or if it means nothing for school districts, has there been any um, guidance from them on it? Uh, there hasn't, to my knowledge. Um, okay. I think the initial proposal from the governor put almost all of it into um, post-secondary education. Um, I haven't heard that, that, that that's changed, so I'm not sure where you know I, 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 that Senate Ways and Means you know budget came out today. I didn't get a chance to look at whether they had any proposals in there or not. Um, so I haven't heard anything to the contrary. So right now, you know, uh, uh, elementary and secondary education. Not 
Yeah, I mean, I've been having uh, discussions on this topic uh, also through my role on the Fiscal Policy Committee at the MMA. And I think you know, we just have to recognize and continue to advocate for it. The, the, the MMA's solution is a significant increase in the dollar amount per student for the so-called minimum aid uh, communities, of which it's about 240 of those uh, communities, including us and some of our uh, ones we're frequently compared to, like Northampton. The result is that um, it, it, if you take the governor's recommendation, which was $30 per student, that amounted to uh, you know less than half a percent or about half of a percent uh, for most districts. And that we're in that category, which is totally inadequate to even come close to meeting inflation costs. And uh, especially when you combine it with uh, other funds available to cities and towns, that it's a big problem. Uh, the question is, how do you come up with a solution to it other than, than that, which... Uh, the House uh, Ways and Means did some, and then took back some when it got to the floor. It was uh, not, it's just, we're now waiting in the Senate, and so I'll be very interested to look at the Senate Ways and Means Committee budget later tonight, too, to get a better understanding of that. Um, the only other thing that I've been able to think about as I've gone through it is something that we have no power to do, and it's just a matter of creating a dialogue about it. And that is to um, make the implementation of the Student Opportunity Act over more years so that a larger amount could be allocated if the legislature isn't going to give more money or has no more money because of the concerns now about revenue than uh, elongating the implementation of the Student Opportunity Act to be, make sure that uh, the legislative process and DESE are conscious of all schools and not just the schools in the greatest need. So, I mean, it, it's a tough and complicated issue. Other questions on this topic? Because if not, then let's go back. You want to just go back to the questions, Doug? Sure, and I, I'll, I'll be happy to just kind of walk through each of those in turn and sure. talk through each one and let people ask questions. Um, the second question, and I'll skip some of the, you know, parts of it that that are about the book that you got. So, um, so the, the there was indication in our in our reporting that with the sixth grade move to middle school, there's some economic circumstances that require the district to lean on non-recurring revenues until we do that. So there's some efficiencies we can gain with moving the sixth grade by. Delaying that, we're going to have to lean on some non-recurring revenues to do that. And and the question was, well, what would be the revenue? Right now, that's ESSER funds. Um, so we have, uh, as the superintendent indicated, indicated uh, about five hundred thousand dollars worth of ESSER funds that we're going to use to help us uh, through the next fiscal year, and that will help to uh, cover some of those costs that that we will hopefully um, not have in the future once we move to sixth grade because of the efficiencies and and uh, overlap with with the regional district that we can take advantage of there. So can you follow us on that one? No. Uh, didn't didn't uh, Paul, didn't you uh, uh, allocate some ARPA funds to help with the transition to the sixth grade to the middle school? So the, do, you to, do you want me to answer that one, Paul? Yeah, so um, when the sixth grade transition was going to happen this fall, um, there was a significant number. Um, there were a couple different projects with the schools, but the largest of which was providing transition funding uh, for, for that transition. Um, since that got delayed, uh, we're sort of we're having discussions with the schools around what happens to that funding, because now um, it likely won't happen within the window of ARPA. Um, so it's part of our sort of second round planning uh, going on. Yes, uh, 
I think that we're all conscious and I think you'll be getting back to this question later too is the limits to the funds that we have from our Nasser and what we're going to do to uh, keep things going when that lift happens. Right. Yep. So Doug, I'm going to go back to you. Uh, Ms. Pam, you have a question on this. Yeah, do we do we have a number for the, the actual cost of establishing the sixth grade at the junior high or middle school? I thought I saw a number somewhere that um, talked about the seventh through twelfth grade as you know sort of a consolidated chunk. Um, and there was a there was a number for that, but there was no mention of the sixth grade. So are we are we not going to wrap the sixth graders into the the regional school bucket. Um, that's really the question. And and who and do we have a cost for, for it if we don't wrap them into the budget? Oh, I think it was the, what I saw was the uh, maybe the administrative structure of of um, teachers and and superintendents and whatever. Okay. I can answer that to some extent. So <clears throat> in our initial work in, in thinking about and working on the transition of moving sixth grade into the middle school building, you know, the conversations with the uh, Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, you know, they were very clear that barring a change to the to the regional agreement, uh, we would have to operate the sixth grade as its own uh, school within a school. And with that separation, it poses some challenges relative to uh, leveraging all of the of the uh, overlapping staff in quite the same way. You can do it, but it's a little more complicated. But there's certain things you have to still do as an independent sort of school uh, for sixth grade, um, you know, from a reporting standpoint, uh, staffing, et cetera, et cetera, that that were part of the complications that that contributed to us putting a bit of a pause on this. Um, that being said, subsequent to that, we also have heard from, uh, you know, the superintendent has heard from some conversations he's had with Desi around regional agreements that they're more willing to entertain slight adjustments to regional agreements as opposed to the traditional modality where they, that if you opened your regional agreement, it was a, it was a wholesale reconstruction kind of thing that took a very significant effort to do. <clears throat> with that more targeted, um, at, you know, changes being allowed or being considered, you know, that gives us a, an opportunity to, to perhaps, uh, you know, leverage that to, to help us out and, and, and mitigate some of those, those potential costs that we'd have if we had an independent sixth grade school in the, in the building here, uh, in the middle school building. But those are, you know, questions we will we'll be, we'll be working on and resolving over the next couple of years. And hopefully, you know, there might be a, a way to perhaps modify a regional agreement to, to make it uh, work better for the you know both the Amherst Elementary and the Regional School District. Um, those questions are pretty open at the moment on that front. Okay, we go on to the next question. Since another, yeah. So the next question is uh, number three on the list was um, a bit of confusion about, and I, I, I fully understandable in looking at the minutes uh, on the reduction of pin pair for educators and then the subsequent school committee motion um so the school committee was was trying to uh you know the 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 overall reduction of para educators is 10 fte um and they would like you know in their motion and the addition of the 84,000 and that you know was all about restoring three positions they they provided a uh, suggestion to the superintendent myself relative to who they thought that should be which would be the library para Fair educators is who they were suggesting would be those three, if at all possible. So, um, the the total number of reduction was ten. They were trying to move it back to seven, and those that difference of three in in their opinion and their recommendation to the superintendent was was the library pair pair professionals. You can just keep going and okay. See um, next on the on the list is it is a. Uh, is a uh, reference to the uh, trend analysis under custodial spending for the district, um, and I have to admit this is this is this is definitely my fault. Um, so, if you're looking at the at the graph that's under trend analysis, the increase from from fiscal 23 to 24 looks rather profound, and some of that's um, 
understandable by virtue of uh, you know great you know uh, steps and colas offered to the the custodial staff, plus some additions to our um, summer staff and substitutes because of the increase in 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 minimum wage up to fifteen dollars. <throat> but the biggest reason for the big jump in what you see on the graph is the fact that uh, the fiscal twenty three budgeted uh, salary numbers uh, were not adjusted. Uh, to reflect the new contract. So the you know, we were developing the fiscal 20 um, for, but well, let me go back a step. We we're developing the fiscal 23 budget and started fiscal 23 and we made, uh, and we resolved the, the um, well, during our development of fiscal 23, we resolved the contract with the custodial staff, but that those changes weren't formally introduced into the, into the, the budget. At this point, we will make those corrections uh, by end of year, obviously, uh, but it does in this case uh, make the jump look a little higher because those are our pre-settlement of contract wage estimates for that budget in there. So that makes the jump like 10% instead of more like four or five. Um, and so that's that's the real reason that that jumps as much as it does. It's all fewer. I'm happy to answer. That wasn't necessarily the most clean description of what happened, but it's really more an artifact of, of an update to the, the fiscal 23 budget that hasn't happened. Um, so next is uh, trend analysis for special education IDA. It says the grant funds fluctuate between the three districts. Uh, is that one grant to three districts and it's, it, is it common? And the answer is yes. So we have uh, our regional school district serves as a financial agent for our IDEA, which is a special education uh, grant that helps us in terms of just sort of management and paperwork and that sort of thing relative to that grant, which is a fairly large grant. Um, you know, it serves as the financial agent for that. Um, and so we have staff that work, for example, we have staff that work in our elementary schools that are paid from the regional school district because they're fully funded by that grant. Um, but the actual amounts for each district vary a little bit from year to year based on student need and, and our application to, to the federal government for those IDA funds. And so that causes some variability there. Um, and let's see the point I make on that. Um, and no, it's not very common. I would say there's very, very few districts that have a structure like we do. Um, there are a few, but very, very few. And so I don't think it's common that, that uh, you would have a, a single district acting as the financial agent for three. I'm sure it exists in some other places because it's certainly allowed by the by the grant, but it's not very common. All right. Um, so the next question, which was about the bilingual education grant, um, and and we're showing that we're not expecting any funding from that, and you know how will that affect the Comanantes Comanantes program uh, at Fort River? The interesting thing about that grant is it has been a grant that the state has funded during the fiscal year with the expectation that you will exhaust those funds in that same fiscal year. Um, and as such, we budget expecting not to get it. We've been fortunate to get it and, it, and it provides a tremendous amount of funding and opportunity for us to to augment what we have uh, budgeted relative to that program and and those those uh, services that we offer in and around that program. So we budget the Comanantes program. Uh, assuming we won't get the grant, and then if we do, which we have been fortunate the last several years, uh, then we leverage those funds to enhance that program even more. Um, it, from from my perspective, as someone who's trying to budget and plan and be thoughtful about some of the stuff, it's a difficult circumstance. It it, it doesn't uh, make it easy to to uh, to budget just because you can't count on those funds. But but nonetheless, they are very supportive of our program and helpful to augment what we already have uh, in our budget. Have they made a budget decision for the next year yet, or? Uh, not that I'm aware of, no. Um, you know, unfortunately, we have a couple of grants. There's a smaller one we've gotten in special education, more around mental health and say student services, not really special education. Um, and sometimes they award them. I mean, we uh, the bilingual grant, there, there have been years where we're awarded the grant in February and have to exhaust the funds by, by June. And depending on how much money that is, that gets harder to do. and and try to be thoughtful about the use of those funds. And so um, they haven't yet made decisions to my knowledge uh, about that for the next year. All right. 
Um, question seven, which is what happens with ESSER funded positions in fiscal 25. Um, we've eventually, we've, we have in this budget uh, eliminated all ESSER funded positions. So those positions are, are essentially being removed from our budget uh, so that all of the funds can be used for just general budget support of, of, of uh, existing sort of programs and staff. And so in fiscal 25, um, we won't have any of those to, to, uh, to reduce. Um, question eight is, do you, do you do projected budgeting for future years? If so, what do you project and what is the adjustment strategy? Um, what I've written as a response here is that with three of our six union contracts not quite not settled yet, uh, it's difficult to make good projections out into the future years. Um, we do some forecasting in in regard to that and try to have an anticipation of what that's that's going to look like. Um, and it, and I think once we settle the contracts, we'll take a deeper look at at our projection for future years. And I think that you know, barring any real strong changes to where we are from a revenue standpoint, um, I think it's going to be difficult to to uh, uh, maintain things exactly as they are. So I think we're going to have to have a pretty significant um, conversation about our our programmatic stuff and 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 our you know, what our programs are, how we do it. Uh, and I think we're going to have to do a deep dive relative to that. I don't think we're going to have a sudden drop in enrollment that lowers our costs significantly. I don't think we're going to have a huge influx of of Chapter 70 money or any other funding from the state that's going to sort of solve the sort of general trajectory of, of our costs. And so uh, we're, we're likely to have to have a real uh, deep conversations about how we sustain ourselves in the future, keep our programmatic uh, uh, offerings, you know, competitive and, and appropriate for the kids and, and as rich as, as the community expects them to be. And I think this ties back to what Mike indicated earlier and Paul and, and Sean spoke to is that we're <clears throat> we're going to look to to work with uh, a small group of of folks from the school side and the, and the town side to look into some some things we might be able to do um, relative to to being more sustainable as we move ahead and in ways we can leverage and and uh, uh, benefit from from cooperative uh, exchange between school and town and and think about how we might you know uh, manage or mitigate some some cost increases in the future and, and help us uh, sustain ourselves out into future years. Okay, other questions? Looking at the, Lynn? Thanks, Doug. Um, I have a couple of questions. First of all, could the questions please be added to our packet? And second, um, Doug, uh, thank you for spending time on the responses. I want to go back to the Comandantes program and the grant that you refer to that we don't know if and when it's coming is from state or federal money. It is state money. Okay. It's a little, I mean, I understand the need to budget in advance for the program so that it doesn't go away if the funds don't appear. Are How much are those funds? And when they do appear, my question would be, is there any opportunity to release some of those funds that are presently dedicated to the Comandantes program to other program funding? So, um, so of course, I didn't look up what those actually are. Uh, they have been pretty significant, I would say, as far as the the grant funding there, and I and I don't think I have that easily in hand. But it's it is and has been, I want to say, you know, one hundred and eighty, two hundred thousand dollars kind of size of of numbers, and maybe a little larger in in some years versus others. Um, you know, there are some restrictions on what it, you know the grant can be spent on. Uh, there's some non-supplanting rules generally around the grant, so you can't sort right. of swap one thing for another. So there's some limitations there, um, but certainly, you know, it does relieve certain stresses. So it, 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 you know, in the broader general effect, is does it, um, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats in a way. So if there are pressures in other parts of the budget, you know, can we make a shift to to cover things that way? Certainly. Um, I think we've been fortunate that that uh, we haven't needed to do much of that, um, but there are a tremendous number of of things we've been able, I think, to add to the program by virtue of having that funding, that really enrich it and and uh, make it even better. 
uh, because we've been able to use that funding to, to you know, get more you know, materials and resources and, and, and uh, uh, do more to support the program that just, it wouldn't make the program not function or not be good. It's just better because of that. And so, you know, we've been able to enhance that program, I think, in a way that's pretty significant. Um, and that's, that's, you know, uh, been really helpful. And, and at the same time, it, because of the limitation of the grant, we really couldn't sort of leverage it elsewhere, but it, it does have a, a pretty broad effect. I, I want to be very clear. I wasn't suggesting we use the grant money right. elsewhere. That, right. My no, no, that's, grant that's contract pays, no, that's not allowed. Mm -hmm. uh, but the issue was that you have existing uh, town, state, whatever, you have a dis, a dis, a existing other budget money that you've already used for the program, getting the money from the state for the Comandante's program, does that help release some of the already budgeted money for other programs? That was why. And you've answered that. I just want to make sure I, you, I wasn't suggesting the mis-expenditure of grant funds in any way, shape, or form. Um, I think that's all. Jay, Anna, did you have something? Yeah, and, and I guess by now Doug's getting used to or is already used to my very half-formed question. So Doug, I apologize that this is another one of those. Um, I was looking at the transportation line and I know that it's a relatively small, I mean, 2.9%, right? Um, but I'm trying to reckon with a couple of things and I'm hoping you can help me tease them out. So we're up about $200,000 since 2020 in transportation costs. Um, and I believe we started switching to electric buses in 22, right? Base, I'm, I was looking at where the budget started to change. Um, and so we're saving about 20K a year, it looks like on gas, but I'm curious how we, and I, and I think believe, I don't think you've gotten the newest, we got a grant to help with an, a new electric school bus last year, but I'm, I'm curious if you can talk about the changes both in our purchasing of electric buses, but also if that's impacted the contracts that we have with outside companies. And if you kind of where you're predicting the transportation costs going in the next couple of years, um, are they going to stay at relatively that 2.9% or do you foresee a change? I mean, I think that there's a lot of reasons to go with electric buses, uh, the, the health of the planet being a, a really great one. Um, and at the same time, one of the big appeals to electric buses is that hopefully we save money on fuel costs, right? Um, and I know that we're, we're navigating some issues with maintenance of those buses, but I'm, I'm curious if you've got projections on transportation and, and where you see that going, or if you have any insights that I'm really missing. I was trying to just show the, look at the difference, because we're looking at about a 60K increase this year in transportation, roughly. So I, I think the, the there's a few things I'll, I'll point out here. One is that we currently have one electric bus, um, which has, has had its its issues from a performance standpoint, but um, you know, it's sort of a, a first generation for a new manufacturer. So uh, you know, that's gonna happen to some extent. Um, uh, you know, we've had, and uh, if you've been involved in the capital conversations, you know, ongoing dialogue about what's what's our next step relative to that. Um, I think the thing I'll point out that that it's probably driving things more so than anything else is that we have a, a hybrid system of how we do transportation. So part of our transportation cost is our buses to drive our kids around, but we also have contracts with uh, third party vendors that do some of it as well. Those contracts uh, and the price in those contracts are uh, have a built-in inflation factor. So they're based on the sort of New England area uh, consumer price index and how it's changed over the last 12 months. So for the coming year, that overall increase in the contract was um, about seven and a half percent, I believe, if I remember correctly. Um, I was gonna say 7.94, but I know that's the health insurance. So it's not 7.94, I think it's seven and a half percent or just shy of seven and a half percent. So that drove, drove all that up. The other factor that plays into our transportation costs is how many students we have and how far we drive them. So in the calculation of how to divvy up the costs between our regional district, our, our Amherst district, um, uh, our Leverett and Shrewsbury elementary districts that also are in and part of that system, it's driven by how many students and how far. And so sometimes the, the cost increase are driven by how many students we have. So if we've had an uptick or, or a sustaining of students in, in our Amherst district and a drop in students in our regional district, that's gonna boost our cost. Um, so those are, those are multiple factors that all play into this a little bit. Um, 
I think depending on how, you know, generally speaking, um, you know, our bus contract is is likely to stay fairly similar. So as inflation goes, it will go. And then depending on enrollment, it'll make a little difference as to how our trends will be. Um, certainly if we start shifting to more uh, electric vehicles, and I think that's a general direction we want to head. I think, you know, the, the upfront cost of those buses is pretty significant. Um, I think the year over year, you know, operating and maintenance costs are probably less, um, you know, and, and certainly uh, we hope to sort of recoup some of that. I think, that, you know, it, it, it's a different paradigm. So we're gonna have to think about our, our transportation system generally over the next couple of years as we strategize about how best to move move ahead in that in that move to a, a more electrified um, busing and transportation system. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. I have a question. I have a question on on buses similarly, but that is, um, are the are all the listed capital items that we looked at through JCPC, are they actually now incorporated into this school budget, or are they separate? So when when I look at the percentage of money spent on uh, on the school, the fifty two percent of the town budget spent on the school. Are those school buses, are all those capital projects, the building maintenance included in your number? Um, so the, the school budgets uh, don't include the capital capital expenses. So any of those things that are in the capital budget, you know, whether it be for the school bus or, you know, infrastructure or, or those, you know, large projects uh, are all wholly within the capital budget. I mean, obviously we do in our budget have uh you know some regular maintenance and 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 uh, custodial services and utilities and all of that sort of stuff that is in our budget so our our you know sort of more modest day-to-day -day, um operational you know uh repair and maintenance of our buildings are included in there but the larger uh sort of projects uh are are in the capital project uh capital budget i should say and separate we should we should actually add those in when we're looking at total costs for for education yeah, I would. I mean, for all departments, really. I mean, well, you could you could take the there's a pie chart in the capital improvement program that breaks down the the capital allocation among departments. So, um, yeah, you could look at every department and adjust for for capital and it changes from year to year. So it's not as predictable as the the operating budgets. Yeah, yeah. I want to add something while we're on that topic, just so for the sake of uh, the rest of the community and the councilors who are present. Uh, what uh, is being discussed is really applicable to all departments, which is why there's a problem with the analysis that a member of the public put out in an email that was received by the council and uh, that i probably going to have to respond to as finance committee chair because um, in for ex the example that was focused on there was DPW. Well, the DPW pie chart that um, was being shown only um, was a portion, as it turns out, of DPW. It wasn't even the full DPW budget. And um, it didn't include any capital whatsoever. And most of our investment, a lot of our investment in um, the uh, DPW is, um, you know, the, the paving and uh, capital costs that show up through the uh, capital improvement program. So that uh, was not an accurate portrayal um, of the actual allocation of funds for DPW. Um, and, uh, you know, is something that um, I think we need to correct for the council and for the public. Uh, and there were some other problems with it I'm not going to get into. But I just, uh, this was just an opportune time to point that out. Uh, Dorothy, you have a question. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Um, so, um, as after under COVID, we've the state has given all kinds of extra money in different little accounts. Uh, and we know that that as COVID funds is going to be uh, gone very, very soon. Um, but also the state has reduced over time the regular amount of funding that it was giving. Um, so do you have any um, clues or hints from people connected to the state 
that they might actually continue under some guise or, I mean, right now it's so complicated, I, I couldn't possibly follow it. Um, don't know how you do. Um, giving some more funds to the to local districts. It would be called something, it wouldn't be called COVID money, it would be called something else. But is there any hint that they realize that people really did like getting and needed getting that extra money and want to going to keep getting it? Yeah, I think that that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, I haven't heard of anything specific that anyone's talking about. Do I do I think that there's some appetite for for those kinds of funding? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I think every school district would certainly appreciate some additional funding and and certainly some of the conversations relative to um, you know the special education and out of district placement is one area that they're trying to sort of recognize uh, and and provide some some support. I think there's some ongoing debate about how best to do that and and how how much it'll help a given district versus another. But, um, you know, I don't know of any other sort of real active conversations relative to that. I mean, I think there are some around, uh, you know, Chapter 70 formulas and and the Mass Municipal Association is, as Andy indicated earlier, is trying to, to advocate for greater funding there. Um, but I don't know of any additional ones offhand. And, and these are federal funds, Dorothy, so they typically come and then go away. Um, the past times we've seen this, we had um, ARA funds in the late 2009, 2010. Um, we had Ed Job funds at one point for the schools, um, and now we've got ARPA and ESSER. But um, with federal funds, I think the past experience has been they come, they are there for a short period of time, and they help, um, and then they cause a lot of issues when they kind of disappear, um, which is what we're dealing with now. Thank the you. one exception, though, was the in the supplemental they did do the the school lunches and food program. Uh -huh. yep. Jennifer. Yeah, I'm just um, since you know what one you know and the superintendent uh, spoke about a little earlier, but what really stands out is that the school enrollment has declined so much over the last. I mean, it may be a period of you know ten to fifteen years. But and expenses have, you know, increased. So, do you look at sort of project out, have any sense of demographic trends, and or if we were able to increase enrollment, whether it was families moving in, would and that would be more per pupil dollars from the state. Could that happen without actually increasing expenses, so that that would be a gain in terms of a greater enrollment and um, help us reach our bottom line better? Um, I think the short answer is, is that, you know, would increasing enrollment help us a little bit? It, I, I think it certainly would. Uh, it, but at the same time, the amount of state aid that we get relative to, to our students, uh, you know, is, is, has overall been decreasing. So as a percentage of, of our budget, the amount of support from the state is less than it was, and it has been declining for a number of years. That's also true on the town side of things. Uh, you know, if you look at budgets from 10, 15, 20 years ago and the percentage of the budget that was carried by the state uh, resources that that came to cities and towns, uh, it's a much smaller fraction than it was. And so that's a that's a systemic problem, both for schools and uh, towns, uh, as far as their budgets are concerned. Um, I think the other difficulty we run into is that often the increases that you get or you might see relative to, you know, some of that funding formula, um, you know, don't capture the entirety of the cost. Um, and so if you have a, an uptick in enrollment, but, you know, the town's property values are holding steady, then the property tax that we collect is holding steady uh, and Prop 2.5, you know, the, the limitations there are probably generally slightly less than inflation or added inflation on it in, in a good year. So, you know, we're always in a sort of catch up mode. Um, I could go on for far longer than anyone would like about property tax and, and whether that's the right way to, to do and fund locally. Uh, you know our, our our governments, but I won't. But but long, be, I, I, long before Doug was business manager, he and I would have those conversations in, yeah. in that in that office right there. So that's right, that's right. So it it um you know sort of back to you know wouldn't would it, you know steadying enrollments or increasing enrollments be helpful? Probably a little bit, but probably not quite enough to really make a difference. Okay, thank you. The school choice experience, so we know. Um, anything else? Because um, in the library, then, if uh, no other questions. Bob? Yeah, I just, uh, 
I, I want to express one concern, and and Doug, you've you've been pretty straightforward about this, but I am concerned that we're not keeping up with the costs of the schools. I mean, the cost of the schools are going up higher than the two and a half percent or three percent or whatever it is that that we have. And sooner or later, we're going to hit a wall and we're going to have to do something. And you mentioned you, we're going to need to do that. And, and it's a concern of mine. Um, I think the other aspects of town probably are kind of chugging along. But the school system seems to be a real issue. Um, and I, I don't know, there isn't, I don't have a solution for it. I just want to express a concern that that I think we, we need to figure out how to maintain our schools at a high level in a sustainable way. Um, the other question I have is, um, as we bring the new elementary school on board and start to think about closing down the other schools. I didn't see anything in the documents on how much we spend on each of the elementary schools. When you add it all up, you know, what do we spend on Crocker Farm? What do we spend on Wildwood? And maybe it's there, I didn't see it, um, but I think it would be helpful to have that information. So we know if we're closing that school, that, you know, obviously some of those expenses will go to the new school, but some of them won't. So I think that would be a helpful uh, thing for us to understand how much we're actually spending on each facility or at each facility, right. including, you know, staff and all that. So I don't expect it right now, but it, I think it would be helpful to have that as we go forward. Yeah, I, I think the more straightforward things that we could look at are, are sort of those operational expenses. And I, I don't think we have a good sense of what the new building's going to cost us for some of those things. Some of them will be hopefully much less expensive as we have a much more energy efficient building. Uh, but I think some of the you know, sort of basics of what we're spending now on things like utilities and infrastructure, that sort of stuff, custodial staff. Some of the other ones that are a little trickier is like, how does the staffing change? Like how much reduction will we really see? We will see some you know, efficiencies in in our classes and and that sort of thing. And I think back to your original question or original sort of comment relative to what are we gonna to do to kind of make ourselves sustainable? I mean, we have a, you know, it, it we have an expensive proposition because we have a lot of people and people are expensive. Um, and I think that how we structure ourselves and how we um, uh, go about trying to deliver those, you know, those educational programs to kids is is something we're gonna to have to look really deeply at over the next couple of years and, and and I think in concert with the conversation that that uh, we're going to start pretty soon on the more infrastructure like things, I think, relative to, you know, ways to combine with the town or or, or work with the town staff to to find uh, ways to streamline ourselves are going to definitely be conversations we have to have. It's, it's not, you know, we would like to have them. We're going to have to have them um, because I think the, the economic pressures are just there. Um, and there's no, you know, sort of manna from heaven to to help us out uh, in in regard to that. So, um, you know, there's there's definitely some 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 work to be done and and things we have to think about. And and we'll probably have to make some really hard choices about what has most value to us. Um, you know, whether it be class sizes or what we offer, a whole host of things we have to balance in that. Um, Back to your other point, um, I can I can definitely try to put some things together as far as what our schools cost us. We do sort of categorize our expenses mostly that way. So so we can kind of put those together. We tend to on the sort of composite sheets kind of smoosh them all together. Um, we say like school administration. Well, that's all three schools as far as the elementary school, you know, but we do have those broken out for specifically to to the buildings. And so um, I can put a little something together in that regard and, and get that to you guys as well. Yeah, I think that would be helpful to know. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Lynn? Yeah, I just want to make note that uh, we did receive a memo from Paul providing a, some additional explanation about the fiscal sustainability working group, and that I've asked that that be added to this packet and also to the packet for the council on the 15th. Um, I think that along with our regional discussion that we just where we have talked about needing to take a hard look at the um, whole infrastructure issue of the two high, the two schools um, and what's coming up there. 
I'm assuming some of that will get folded into that larger discussion that Paul is proposing and has approached the superintendent about. So I'm not yeah, asking uh, for, I, I'm semantic. not asking for the comment now, just hope hopefully we will. Yeah. Just an explanation. There was a memo that was received by counselors this morning, and I will send it to Bob Matt and Bernie, uh, our resident members of the committee. Uh, either later tonight or tomorrow morning so that you see it and that's what she's um lynn is referring to as being added to the packet so that you know what the process is that paul is uh developing to identify this i don't know paul if you want to say anything else or let the memo ride Yeah, it, it's a very brief memo. It just sort of outlines a little bit more in a slightly more detail about how we'd like to move forward on it. And if there are questions, we can answer that. So with that said, is there anything else for schools? Otherwise, I think we can uh, move on to library and which is the other topic for tonight in public comment, just see if there's any public comment. Um, so, Doug, thank you very much. And uh, again, thank uh, Mike and Allison uh, for being here and for you hanging on. All right. I will let them know. And thank you all very much for taking the time out and asking the good questions. So thank you. And I'll, uh, I'll be back in touch about those couple of questions you guys raised and some data that you wanted. So I'll send that along. Thank you. Okay. And uh, just so you know, and you can convey this along, uh, that uh, we're in a mode right now of meeting with the uh, functional you know schools library and then the various departments and uh may 23rd we'll begin to shift into the discussion within the finance committee about what our recommendation to the council will be so Great. that's what the process is so um, the fact that we didn't have a discussion about for example um the school committee request for the x for an additional eighty four thousand dollars it wasn't that we didn't hear it, but the finance committee wouldn't didn't anticipate that this is the stage for discussion. So thank you. Understood. Thank you so much. Okay, so we're going to switch to library, but let me just ask real quickly. Uh, we do do uh, public comment at every meeting. I indicated at the beginning of this meeting that we were postponing public comment because the superintendent and the chair of the school committee at a limited time here, but the, um, it is important. And so if there are any members of the public who would um, like to um, offer public comment, uh, they should feel free to raise their hand, but it doesn't have to be the matters that we're being discussed today, but any matter that's relevant to the Finance Committee uh, in any way, shape or form is certainly welcome. So. I'll pause for just a second to see if there are anybody who raises hands from the attendee group who would like to make comment. Seeing none, I think we can move on to the library budget. And at this point, I'm gonna make the same disclosure that Anna made earlier um, about schools. And uh, then I'm going to actually turn the meeting over to Anna uh, to chair, since Kathy's not here as vice chair, I appreciate uh, that you're willing to uh, take this role on. Um, as uh, uh, most people or many people know, uh, my wife is a part-time employee of the library working at Branch Library. It's, and um, as a consequence, uh, I have consulted with the Ethics Commission and filed um, notice with the town clerk, uh, making public that um, there is this uh, uh, circumstance. Um, however, um, I don't believe that anything that the Finance Committee will be recommending or the Council will be acting on is, a, is going to affect um, the um, employment or benefits um, that are received by my wife. If they were, then I would totally um, remove myself from any of the meetings. Um, however, 
uh, because of that circumstance, even though I'm not going to remove myself from the meeting, I did ask Anna to chair this section. So I'm turning the meeting over to her. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that. I want to welcome Sharon Sherry, who is the uh, library director. And Sharon, I believe that you are the only one here from the libraries. Is that correct? Is there anyone else that will be joining you? Uh, well, I'd like to recognize library trustees Bob Pam and Lee Edwards. Um, after my presentation, they may have something to say, so you could bring them in now or later, whatever you like. Um, I don't have that power. Sean, are you able to do that? Yes. Um, sorry, I just grabbed water. Did you ask to bring in um, Bob, the trustees? Bob, okay. Bob Pam and Lee Edwards. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. Um, all right, so reminder to folks who are with us today, the budget and Sharon's presentation is in the packet um, and available on the website. And so without further ado, Sharon, I will I will turn it over to you and then we will start with the pre-prepared questions uh, and then we'll go to any other questions from the finance committee or counselors, if that sounds all right to everyone here. All right. And will you let me share my screen? Yeah, uh, Sean will, uh, I think, because again, I do not have that power, but. Um, you should have it. If you don't, I mean, is it, is it saying no? Hang sure. on, no, hang on. I'm coming. And welcome, Bob and Lee. Nice to have you with us. And I, so right now I'm going to share my screen. I have a PowerPoint presentation. I have also, it's a quick presentation, um, but I have also received your questions in advance. And so what I've done is I've interspersed the answers to those questions throughout my presentation. Great. Thank you. Let's do, I got too many things in the way now. Hey, here we go. Multitasking, here we go. Okay, so um, on your screen are our uh, revenue sources. 75% of the library's total operating budget will come from the municipal appropriation for FY24. The appropriation is only used for staff salaries, benefits and the rent for Munson Memorial Library. The town appropriation does not fund things like books or maintenance, utilities or programs. State aid will account for almost 4% of our budget. Uh, and that's an important bucket because we need those funds to cover the staff salaries that the town appropriation does not cover. 9% of our budget is gonna come from donations to the friends, the sale of merchandise like t-shirts, uh, meeting room and printing fees and grants. And for FY24, the big grant is, is a, a multi-year federal grant that was awarded to our ESL department. 12% of our library's operating budget will come from the endowment draw in FY24. Uh, and for FY24, the trustees again uh, approved a 4% draw rate. Uh, now, when we say that we are withdrawing funds, funds from the endowment, the, the Woodbury funds are not included in that calculation. The endowment and the Woodbury fund are treated separately uh, because the Woodbury fund spending is determined by the friends of the library. And that's a, a requirement of the Woodbury bequest. With the exception of the renovation of the Woodbury Room 10 or so years ago, the Friends have historically taken a 4% draw, usually it's a little less than that, from the Woodbury Fund every year. It's about $25,000, $26,000, $27,000 a year. Uh, and those funds pay for library programming and circulating materials. On June 30th of 22, the endowment was at $8.2 million, and the Woodbury Fund was at $660,000. 66% of the library's FY24 expenses will be that of personnel and almost 13% for benefits. Almost 9% of our budget goes towards the purchase of circulating materials such as books, magazines, all our digital content. Utilities will account for 3% of our budget, maintenance another 3%, and programming is at 2%. I know you cannot see this, um, but uh, the library's FY24 budget was approved by the trustees on March 15th. 
So here's why FY24 is going to be complicated for us. It's because of the building project. So for half the year, we'll be located in the Jones building. And for the other half, we'll be in a swing space or an interim space. So our salaries and benefits and programming figures, those can be projected relatively easily throughout the year, regardless of where we're located. But our building related costs, like our building systems and equipment and grounds, HVAC maintenance, utilities, those are gonna change halfway through the year. Um, but in crafting this budget, we, we've been very conservative. So if anything, um, we'll spend less. Overall, we're pr proposing a 7% increase over FY23. And this is primarily due to the $61,000 that will come in through that ESL grant. Not counting that grant, the increase would have been 5%. Under expenses, we're showing a 6.7 increase to salaries. And uh, that, why this is, is uh, we'll be filling two of our four vacant positions. And we're going to be making full time one of our part time over 20 positions. Uh, and both of those efforts are going to help to reduce our reliance on part time under 20 positions. Because we're filling two out of those four vacant full time positions, along with the fact that the town health insurance costs are rising, uh, pretty bit for uh, FY24, there's going to be a 13% increase to our benefits line. We're going to see a 0.8% increase uh, to materials and a 10% decrease to operations. And this is primarily because I took a line uh, book processing and I moved it into the materials category. Uh, however, we have also reduced staff development and some office supply lines. We're going to see a 9% decrease to our annual CWMARS assessment, a 3.6% increase to maintenance and repairs, and a 2% decrease to utilities. Programming is increasing by 138%. Again, that's due to the ESL grant. And the special collections budget is being level funded. And so a, a quick note about our special collections money market account. That account is... Um, from a variety of sources that has been collected over the course of many years, primarily through donations. Um, there's a balance of approximately $50,000 in that account right now, uh, and it is all of that money is restricted uh, for use for the preservation of, of our archives, the, the collection. Under revenue sources, we're showing a 3% increase to the municipal appropriation in accordance with the town manager's directive, a 5.7% increase to the endowment draw, even though the rate is remaining at 4%, and a 151% increase in the use of state aid, and that's what we'll be using to cover the salaries. Now that the friends are responsible for the library's fundraising efforts, these the next two lines on your screen, gifts and grants and friends and Woodbury, they're, they're pretty much starting to mingle with each other. So we're, we're heading towards that will just be one line. Um, we are not including Sammy's income for 20, FY24 because instead we're planning a major capital campaign event. Grants are applied for by the staff but the restricted gifts and donations to the Friends and the Woodbury funds, those are all now under the umbrella of the Friends. So when we calculate the increase or decrease in the reliance of those funds, basically both of those lines should be added together. And for FY24, the end result is a 25% increase. Many thanks to the Friends at the library and for all of you who, who donate to the Friends. The sale of merchandise, uh, sale of goods, is has been transferred to the friends. They are now in charge of buying our, our merchandise, buying and selling our merchandise. So that line is zeroed out for FY24. And we're projecting a 30% decrease to fees and lost books. And, and this is because income that we are receiving due to lost books ha has been decreasing over the years. So uh, we're just, we're being conservative. Um, also, because we won't be in the Jones for the full year, we won't be taking in revenue through uh, meeting room fees. 
And then we are increasing our use of our BE&R funds by 100%. And I, I was glad that you asked me about this question. Um, so BE&R stands for Building Expansion and Renovation Account. And this dates back to the 1993 Jones Library Expansion Renovation Project. There's about $8,200 in this line. 48 4891 is restricted to the North Amherst Library building. So I'll be working with Jeremiah on um, transferring that money over to him uh, so the town can spend that on the building. And the remaining 3300 is for the Jones Library expansion project, this, this new one that's coming up. I thought I would give you a quick update on the Jones Library building project and the capital campaign. We have completed design development and expect to receive a reconciled cost estimate in late May, early June. We will then move into the construction document phase and receive the final cost estimate late November. We would then go out to bid in late November and award a contract with a general contractor in February 24. Construction would begin in March of 24, and then 18 months later, give or take, uh, the grand opening celebration would take place in December of 25. So as long as that timeline isn't delayed, the trustees would owe its final memorandum of agreement payment to the town in July of 26. And that is the same time that the town would receive the final disbursement from the MBLC. Because we can only receive one MBLC disbursement per fiscal year, it, if there are any changes to the timeline, it would it would push back the final MBLC disbursement to uh, July of 27. Speaking of the trustees' share of project costs, towards its goal of raising 16 million, the capital campaign has received grants, earmarks, gifts, and statements of intention, totaling almost 5.8 million. I wanted to also point out that we submitted our first Massachusetts Historic Tax Credits application, for which we expect to be rejected. And this is the norm. This is what happens 99.9% .9 of the time for the first application. Uh, the benefit to submitting early <clears throat> knowing that we're going to get rejected is along with that rejection, we will get comments and, and, and suggestions and, and requirements, things that we need to change. And so we will address those comments in our August application. We will continue to apply every, so it's three times a year, every January, April, and August each year until the end of our project. And we can receive about $2 million from these efforts over these next few years. Also, as you know, we've been working with uh, Senator Comerford and Representative Dome over the past year in an effort to receive additional state funding for the project due to COVID-related cost escalation. And this could result in the neighborhood of an additional $4 million-ish. Um, that, was, that was all my prepared comments. I'm happy to take more questions. Thank you so much. Um, Sharon, just to confirm, there weren't any questions. Oh, okay. I was going to say, I will turn this over to Lynn because I uh, also want to thank Lynn for being the person who compiled the questions on the library. And Lynn, were there any additional questions that uh, you had before we open it up to the committee? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Sharon has, I think, addressed all of the questions. I do have one that kind of expands beyond that. Uh, and we can probably go ahead and take down the uh, presentation. Uh, but the response to the questions are in your packet as well. And I want to thank Sharon for those written responses in advance uh, and for incorporating into your presentation now the responses to those questions. So, uh, but I do want to push on one, and it, this is really a question for probably Sean and Paul. And that is, it to me, it's a little confusing to see ish, uh, money related to the actual building in the budget. So I'm trying to figure out how does that sort out when we do the renovation expansion? Although what I'm hearing is the renovation expansion line in this budget is from the previous time. Yes, 
Yeah. So, so to clarify, it's not, it's used for repairs, building repairs. Uh, and, and, um, basically what I'm going to do the money for the Jones expansion project, uh, once town council votes again, uh, I I will work with Sean and I, I have several other funds. I, I forget what the total is, um, but I will basically be cutting a check and sending it all over to Sean so that those funds can be used for so that. So we'll be keeping project. a exactly. separate account yeah. of the building and the renovation and expansion yeah. under a separate accounting. I'm looking at Paul. I'm looking at Sean. I'm we, looking- We have a, so we have a few things. So we have- um, we have a fund that's set up dedicated to the library building project. Um, within that fund, there's a borrowing, which is the authorization that for the town share. Um, there's the grant uh, funding, which we have the first payment of, and that will be where we store any of the grant payments in the future. Um, and then we have a donation uh, account. And so any of the fundraising, any anything like that, and I think there's already been an initial payment, um, that goes into this donation account. Um, so it really depends sort of on what the nature is of what Sharon sends us. If it's, again, if it's fundraising, we would put in our donation account. If it's something else, we would classify it based on what it is. Um, but we would make sure it's dedicated to the project. Okay. And then um, because we now have two big capital projects moving forward, um, I'm going to ask Paul and Sean, uh, on behalf of the Finance Committee, how do we now see those accounts? And will we see them quarterly like we do the regular fiscal updates? Or how will the Finance Committee and the Town Council see accounts associated to major building projects? Yeah, no, it's a good question. I what I recommend, and, and we can figure out a way to do this, is that there's going to be reports, and there have been reports that are already given to building committees dedicated mm -hmm. to these projects. And we can make, they're already, I believe, posted, but we can make them available um, to the Finance Committee and the Council. So for example, once a month, uh, the OPM for the Jones Library project presents a, a budget um, overview of how the project's doing from a budgetary standpoint. Um, again, very early on, so there's not, it's not super exciting at this point, but um, that same type of thing will happen with the school project. And so I think instead of recreating it, we can just share those reports um, and then answer any questions you have. In, my goal is not to undercut question or in any way suggest that the building committees aren't doing their job. It's just that in mm -hmm. both cases, the town council has authorized significant money. And I think we need to make sure that the finance committee, where we've always agreed large capital projects are, if you will, funded from or recommended from or whatever. Um, we just need to be, you know, have updates as well. Yeah, no, that's a good um, a good idea. Yeah. And Paul and I can yeah. think maybe the town manager report too, maybe makes sense at some point. Yeah. We, we can put we can put those documents into the finance committee's folder uh, every we get them monthly from this uh, building committees and, and the building committees look at that the, each building committee has to approve every invoice that is spent out of those funds yeah I've so those that. are those are actual um, actions by the building committee mm -hmm. and then and as in that process you know there is an updated sort of progress report on all the finances so we, I, you know, I'm not sure if you want to talk about them at every finance committee meeting. You're welcome to do that, but having them in your packet might be a good way to store them in a way. They're also on every on both school, both the building committees' websites as well. I, I, I just think that some, and and you know, the chair of the finance committee and so forth can discuss. You know, do we want kind of a quarterly update at the same time we look at the budget quarterly or something? just so that we continue to be good stewards of the town money since right. and, we, it's huge. And and you have representation on both of those committees as well, right. as you know. That's exactly right. Yes. Thank you. Uh, again, I, I'm done with my questions. Thank you. Are there other questions from the committee, uh, either finance or council committees? Yeah, Bob. Yeah, uh, this is maybe a question for for Bob Pam rather than for for uh, Sharon. But I, I'm 
I'm interested in the stability of the endowment. I know that in the past, we've talked about the endowment may be tapped if the fundraising doesn't quite reach the, the finish line. And I just wanna make sure, I know that I saw on the graph, there was a big drop. Everyone lost money <laughs> in, in the stock market uh, at that time. So uh, was that sort of just the stock market or was it, uh, you know, kind of more of a, you know, are, are, are you concerned about the long-term stability of the endowment? I guess that's the question. Well, the answer to the first question is yes, that was the stock market. I'm not taking any money out. <laughs> um, um, how stable is it? You tell me what the economy is going to look like next year. Uh, you know, I can't give you an answer on that. With the long-term expectation is that the the endowment will grow um, at at least well, I can't say at least at roughly the same rate as our withdrawal rates. So you know, four or five percent is a you know a conservative conservative estimate of what happens when you invest money, um, and that is essentially what we are doing. We are doing it in a conservative way. Um, the other half of your question is um, at the point where the project is moving forward and if there are uh, delays in receiving money through our fundraising, um, that could be a draw upon us. And we have been talking about the uh, possible ability to get external sources through mass development, through other kinds of activities that would be um, <clears throat> practical, useful, uh, which would not endanger the operations of the library, but which we would still have to repay over a reasonably short period of time. But it would then mean that the, the endowment itself does not take a, a sudden and immediate hit. Um, can't tell you how that will all work out, but you know that is where we are going with that. And that, that will obviously depend upon the success of the fundraising. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I just had a question. I, I might have been in this budget and I just wasn't seeing it, but um, there will be some um, expenses associated with the library having to move out <laughs> into different locations. And is that in this budget or is that something that separate? No, that's in the building project. Okay. Package, yeah. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions for library director, Sharon Sherry, Bob Pam, or Lee Edwards? All right, well, we know that they're always happy to answer any questions that do come up, but we appreciate you all taking the time today. Thank you so much for uh, the thoughtful presentation and for responding to the questions ahead of time. We, we appreciate that. Uh, and with that, you are free to enjoy the rest of your Tuesday. And I will turn it back over to Andy. Okay, thank you. Well, I think that uh, we're pretty well done with the agenda for today because it was the principally the two topics that we discussed. I don't think that we have any further minutes as of today that I want to that I can take up. Um, and I have no unanticipated um, matters to raise, so unless anybody else does and would like to um, raise anything else. So Andy, can I just say two quick things? Um, so I'll post in the packet all the questions that we've received so far that we have responses. Um, so that'll include the the sets that you heard tonight um, and some of the capital ones from previous meeting and so on. Um, and then just a heads up that we are likely going to be uh, rescheduling the public health uh, department and the fire department to a later meeting. Um, they were originally scheduled, I think, for actually Friday. Um, but both of the, those departments have conflicts, so they'll likely be the 23rd. Um, uh, so if anybody was looking for those, just a heads up that they're gonna shift. But otherwise, um, the public safety and community services is the major topics of Friday and all other departments and possibly fire, as we haven't given confirmed that yet, um, might be switching just public 
uh, health. So uh, the public safety, of course, includes CRESS as well as uh, police dispatch in addition to fire. Uh, Animal control. So and that'll be Friday. Oh, fair. I'm sorry. You're right. right. Control yeah. them with so on a, That's Friday, yeah. Yeah, do you have a question? Or? I do have a question. Andy, would you be able to send out, I, I hear the update about fire. I could not find an updated um, version of that document with the dates. I know that I am the person who's collecting the questions and writing the memo for public safety, and I'm not able to be there for the bulk of the meeting on Friday. Um, and so I wasn't sure if you had an updated um, <laughs> updated list if I had missed that somehow, and, and I apologize if I had missed it. Um, but I also will use this time to just remind the counselors who are here to please send me any questions that you have on that section of the budget because I want to make sure that I got I get them out and now it's Tuesday and so I'd like to get them to the to Sean tomorrow morning um, to you know give them at least 24 hours to, to consider that um, and I'm going to send an email to the council as soon as this meeting uh, ends but Andy if there are any other public safety folks who also have a slight conflict Friday I would not be uh, upset if they needed to move that as well to a point where I can be there and I apologize that I'm not able to be here for the full meeting on Friday. John will have to answer that question because he's the one who keeps tabs of who can be there when. Yeah, I think everybody else, um, I haven't heard anybody else is unavailable and given our sort of tight window. Um, and Andy was actually planning on sending out this, the revised schedule that you mentioned. Um, he's got it updated. I just need to confirm with fire uh, before he can send it out. Perfect, thank you. And no, I definitely did not mean to suggest that the department heads needed to readjust their schedule. Thank you. Yep, yep. Uh, I just want to confirm, did you get the questions I sent in? Yep, yep, Great. I received them and they've been sent off um, to, to Guilford, yep. Thanks. And Pam? What is the date that um, the general discussion will take place when the uh, Finance Committee starts to make its recommendations? We still plan to start on the 23rd and then follow it at the next meeting after that. Uh, there is a uh, consolidated budget planning calendar and uh, I was going to update it. Um, but I'm still waiting for uh, just final answer about fire department availability before okay, so I do even, it. So, so even though there appears to now be a presentation that day, it'll be presentation and the beginning of discussion. Sounds like. Yes, it will be. And, uh, you know, we, we started, there was, there was a uh, very difficult topic that was raised. Uh, and I'll, I think we'll hold discussion even information about how we can proceed with uh, that issue, which is, of course, the school committee request for additional funds and uh, what the options are that are available to the council, things like that. We'll not, we won't get back to that till the 23rd. Uh, Jennifer. A very quick question. So whenever we the committee meets on Tuesdays, it's this time, 5.30 to 7.30. Yes. Went to four Friday. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, you know, uh, as I say, we have the consolidated budget calendar and with Lynn's permission, I'll send it to the entire council when it's uh, um, approved by Sean, which should be tomorrow. Lynn? Uh, yeah, I, I also just want to bring up that when the finance committee begins to develop its report, we go back to the people who who did the thorough review and the questions. And Andy asks us to draft some initial portion of the report around that. And so the sooner we get some examples, because uh, as you can imagine, with all the different people writing, it looks like apples and oranges, and then Andy has to make it look like lemonade. Uh, so uh, it's really important to understand that we still have a writing assignment that goes with our um, being the person that raised the questions. Okay. And I, I know I personally always want to go back and review the tapes and so forth when I'm trying to do that because I don't take all the specific notes I should. And real quickly, um, 
to Lynn's point, people whose departments had already presented, you could you could start working on that now if you wanted to, um, mm -hmm. so that it's not a crunch at the end. I mean, it's not you can't finalize until we have our last discussion, but um, that report will be due to the finance to the council on um, June first, and will be then discussed at the council meeting on June fifth. Did I get my dates right? Actually, I think it's due the 31st because it's due 30 days after we receive the budget. Let me, uh, I want to try and uh, share screen to show where the document looks like now. Uh, the way that it's written is uh, the 23rd was going to be the initial discussion for the uh, finalized recommendation and then finish that work on the 26th when we'll actually if there are any issues that come up that are identified on the 23rd we won't vote on them on the 23rd but we try and vote on the 26th so that we have a uh, um, complete set of recommendations ready and uh, then the 30th is when we have the uh, final meeting to uh, try and review the budget draft as it's been put together as of that date. Uh, so because we do need to get it to the council and, uh, you know, whether I think if you call it the 30th to the 31st, uh, it's probably the 31st is the actual date. So, so that if, said, yeah, I I'm going to adjourn the council. But before I do that, I just want to thank um, the councilors who have come, who are not on the finance committee, as well as the ones who are. are. Uh, as you've, I think, observed, because I think some of you were also here last year. This is really a great way to learn about our town. Uh, and financial budgets really provide lots of good information. So thanks for spending the time. Um, to attend Thank yet you. another it's, committee meeting. It, it makes so much more sense the second year than last year, I have to say. <laughs> yes. Thank so, you. Thank you. That, the I, council is adjourned. And the finance committee is also adjourned. So thank you and see you on Friday. Thank you. Everybody. Here.